I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So as you may know, um, in the last uh, couple of talks, I have focused on um, some Buddhist myth-busting as a deliberately provocative and, for me at least, kind of fun way to explore some very important uh, points in the Dharma in which, in my view, uh, some misunderstandings uh, have crept in to practice, uh, at least in some places, that are really problematic. Um, so I've framed this as Buddhist myths. And uh, so far, three are pretty darn clear to me. The first one I talked about was the myth that life is suffering, based on a very serious mistranslation of the first noble truth of dukkha in Pali, uh, and a, I think also a misguided preoccupation with the purported unsatisfactoriness of the present moment inherently, simply because it is changing endlessly, which is actually not at all unsatisfactory if it changes into something better, nor is it unsatisfactory, the present moment, if we don't cling to it. And meanwhile, we have arguably the very satisfactory, endless gifting of the arisingness of the next moment. So much for life is suffering. Uh, second, uh, the myth that all you need to be is mindful. Just be mindful, that's it. Don't bother with attempting to release anything problematic and don't bother with attempting to cultivate anything beneficial. That too, I think, is a really serious myth and is belied by so much of the Eightfold Path and other teachings of the Buddha that are about uh, wise effort, which is one of the elements of the Eightfold Path, disengaging from what causes suffering and increasingly fertilizing and protecting and growing and creating that which promotes uh, well-being, uh, love, and happiness. Uh, the third myth I'd like to explore is have no judgments. And it's a particularly tricky topic. It's a tricky myth to unpack because in some senses it's, it's actually true. It's good. But I want to explain. So here, first off, um, think about certain kinds of judgmentalness that are clearly problematic. And you might be aware of them in other people. We tend to be most aware of how other people should have no judgments. They should not be so judgmental, right? We're judgmental about them being judgmental. It can be a little more difficult sometimes to recognize one's own judgmentalness in certain areas that are problematic. And um, so, if you're brave and willing to offer yourself up as a public service, uh, you might put into the chat some examples of your own judgmentalness that um, is, you know, problematic for you. Uh, for me, I've I've confessed that uh, I have a judgment about people who stand in doorways in public spaces, blocking the movement of other people or in busy airport corridors, just plop in the middle of the corridor, talking with their three good friends, while others try to swirl and move around them. I admit I have a judgment about that. Um, and I admit also that I can, uh, to a fault, really quickly kind of recognize something that's problematic or could be better in a situation. And, and it's, it's an accurate recognition. Let's Let's, let's stipulate for the record. Uh, but then wow, <laughs> this kind of intensity, uh, this like I think of it as like the dog in me that goes to chase the ball can get in the mix in a way that uh, comes in hot, you know, comes in uh, blazing and uh, can create friction with other people. So there's a judgmentalness in me that arises about that. Um, thank you, Joan, <laughs> and other people. Uh, putting stuff in. And I'm really glad, Marianne and M. Angel, you're already getting right at uh, the crux of this whole exploration, which is really related to everyday life. So I definitely will be, you know, getting into that. Um, 
certain kinds of judgmentalness we recognize out there in the world, and we have real problems with it. Uh, racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, um, which is you know growing unfortunately in, in many quarters. Uh, different kind ageism, body shaming, um, classism. You know, uh, I had a client of mine who was uh, uh, raised among uh, great wealth uh, and very, 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 very wealthy people, and he. He said they they sometimes had a saying, and he he mimicked someone you know with a teacup with you know the, their pinky raised, N O C D. He said to me one time, and I said, "What is N O C D?" He said, "Not our class, dear." That's obviously a problematic kind of judgmentalism. I'm reading a. Um, a biography right now of Richard Feynman, quite interesting, called Genius. And uh, when he went to college in uh, the early, late 1930s, uh, there was significant uh, quota system and prejudice against admitting Jewish people uh, into, or people who were Jewish, into uh, universities. That's problematic judgmentalism, right? So we can see there are certain kinds that are that are really problematic. Okay. All right. Beyond that kind of obvious problematic judgmentalism, I want to talk about um, some other ways in which the teachings that we can find here and there, particularly in Zen, about releasing judgment, abandoning judgment. We have the teaching of the third uh, Zen patriarch, great great text, trust in mind, or, um, you know, as my friend Stephen Slander puts it, trust in awakening, the opening line, the great way is easy for one with no preferences. Right. We have Rumi, maybe someone will put this uh, quotation in the in the chat, there's, if I recall correctly, something about, maybe it's Hafiz or, oops, sorry, someone, anyway, about meeting in a place beyond good or bad, there we shall meet, in a garden where there's no good or bad, there we shall meet, something like that. So what are they getting at? Well, one way to understand that is that reality altogether simply is what it is. Um, you know, in no ordinary sense of the word is an asteroid having a judgment about another asteroid. The universe altogether simply is what it is, as it is, um, beyond judgment. And arguably, further, more deeply, as the Buddha pointed to, in that which is unconditioned, that which is not um, based on causes, that which is not arising and passing away, that which is therefore timeless, eternal, in there are no judgments either. So as we experience that oneness, judgments fall away. There, there's just no basis for them. And the practice, pragmatically, of releasing judgment, particularly of problematic kinds, can be an, an aid to practices that open us gradually into everything. That's great. Second, awareness as awareness is not judgmental. It can represent and hold anything, much as the screen of a television or other monitor, your smartphone, it can represent anything, right? The screen itself is not judgmental about whether it's showing a horror movie, or Bambi running through the forest joyfully, uh, or pictures, you know, of your child's graduation. Uh, you know, it's neutral. Awareness is neutral with regard to its objects. And that's why pragmatically, again, practices uh, that are about being less judgmental or releasing judgment, particularly while doing formal meditative practices with the aim of becoming more and more aware of awareness. And in fact, increasingly resting in awareness as awareness, as the mind gets quieter and quieter, disengaging from 
preferences from liking and not liking, good or bad. Um, disengaging from all that, certainly in formal practice, is, um, is an aid to resting in the inherently non-judgmental aspects of awareness. That's one reason why a common definition of mindfulness describes it as itself non-judgmental. It simply is sustained present moment awareness, often with a quality, mindfulness, of recollectedness, of a kind of metacognitive oh, mindfulness of being mindful, you know, in the mindfulness. It itself does not pick and choose what it is mindful of. It is mindful of whatever is appearing. Okay, that's a second uh, very useful uh, aspect of, you know, quote unquote, have no judgments. Okay. Third, as uh, there was some back and forth about in the in the chat a little earlier, and you, if if you've come in here before, I wrote it in the chat. You can see what I wrote in the chat about the so-called chain of dependent origination, this kind of circular or even network sequence of things or relationships that the Buddha marked. The Buddha um, pointed out um, a key sequence there, a key moment there, is in this process in which there's a stimulus. Something happens that impinges on our consciousness. We're aware of something. Uh, and then on the heels of that, very rapidly comes its hedonic tone, its so-called feeling tone, which is not about emotion per se. Is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Do we like it? Do we dislike it? Or, eh, meh, uh, is it neither pleasant nor unpleasant, right? And then what happens? You know, if it's unpleasant, do we, does the mind very rapidly move into aversion, dislike, right? Pushing away, freezing in the face of, fighting with, resisting, aversion. Right? Do we add that to what is unpleasant? Or if it's pleasant, ah, do we grasp it? Do we want to hold on to it? Do we want to keep it? Do we get addicted to it? Or can we not do that? Either of those, aversion or grasping in this framework, as forms of craving. The second noble truth in Pali, tanha, for craving, uh, the driver of so much of our suffering. Right there is that opportunity. We cannot stop the flow of stimuli, certainly as long as we're alive, right? One thing after another. And uh, the body, the, certainly the complex nervous system of a human, keeps generating hedonic tones. Over time, we can gradually shape and condition our hedonic tones so that even, even things that used to be immediately unpleasant for us become more and more neutral. Um, things that used to fascinate us and you know, we really, they were really pleasant and yet led to problematic behaviors, more and more we can be um, you know, peaceful about them. We can acquire uh, this quality that's uh, really appreciated in um, early Buddhism. In Pali, the word is nibbida. You might want to look it up, nibida, N-I-B-B-I-D-A in English. Um, it's, pro it's, it's mistranslated as disgust or repulsiveness. Probably a better translation is disenchantment because obviously disgust or repulsiveness are, you know, repulsiveness is, is something we add to an object. Disgust is something we add to an object and we're adding unpleasantness. And that's really different from disenchantment waking up from the spell of various things that have had this allure for us, uh, including some that are negatively valenced. You know, we, we had a lot of aversion for them. We can wake up from that spell over time so that things that were initially very unpleasant or very pleasant for us gradually lose their charge over time. And there's often a psychological process involved with that when dealing with trauma material or other kinds of you know, really, or addiction material over time. That's true. Over time, we can shape those, that feeling tone, uh, which is the territory, uh, that a hedonic tone of the first darts of life that the Buddha talked about. And we can extend that analogy to things that are so really pleasant. We might call them the first, I don't know what, the first siren songs, the first 
um, seductions, I don't know, the first pulls of life. But in any case, once it happens though, once something is pleasant or unpleasant, at that point we have choice. And do we move into the next step, into the chain of dependent origination of craving, and the one after that of clinging, leading to suffering, or not? So here is where judgment can really play a role, and becoming less judgmental can play a role in installing more and more of a shock absorber uh, between the hedonic tone and the reactions to it. So let me define judgment right now as having two elements for sure, inherently, often a third element. The first element is a kind of discernment. We're recognizing something. Now, maybe what we think is true is not actually true, so it's a mistaken kind of discernment or recognition. Uh, we're seeing or hearing. Or, uh, we misunderstood the word they used, let's say, something like that. Uh, but it's still a discernment. There's still, a, you know, that right there is contact. A stimulus, we're, we're aware of something, okay? Second, there's a valuing. Good or bad, skillful or unskillful, enjoyable or painful. There's a valuing, moral, immoral, ethical, unethical. Appropriate, inappropriate, there's a valuing. No valuing, no judging. No discerning, no judging either. And then third, very often in the mix, is, um, is a hedonic tone. And sometimes that hedonic tone moves into awareness even faster than um, even faster than uh, the the, discer the conscious discernment and the conscious um, you know feeling tone or, or pardon me valuing there we go um, like putting your hand on a hot stove or you you step on a on a something sharp let's say with bare feet and instantly you know there's the um, hedonic tone of it and then you know on the heels of that might come some conscious valuing or discerning, but boom, you immediately dislike it. Other times, there's just the discerning and the valuing. But in any case, there's a judging. And by the way, I'm seeing a lot of chats come through. I really encourage you to orient to this in emotional terms, in your own life, in your own relationships, rather than through various abstractions. Because that's where the rubber really, really hits the road in the ways in which being judgmental is problematic for us. And yet, on the other hand, as I'll get to, can really serve as well. So the third kind of problematicness of judgmentalism is typically related to negative, unpleasant feeling tones, hedonic tones. And um, so with regard to that, uh, you know, you can just see the ways in which our judgmentalness, our, our valuing of various kinds, and especially our emotional reactivity can get into the mix. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, so I used to travel a lot, you know, pre-COVID and kind of pre-dialing back some. And so I'd be in airports a lot. And I like airports, actually. Uh, and I you know, see a lot of things that happen in airports. And as the uh, air travel system is increasingly like a Swiss watch, so intertwining, any little thing uh, goes wrong. You know, an airplane needs to change a tire in Bangkok. And then my flight's delayed you know, 12 hours later in Paris or something like that. Uh, things happen. And you know, I myself definitely can get caught up in you know that grumbling that comes in, right? You're discerning that your flight is now delayed an hour and a half. The valuing is, oh, that's going to be problematic for me, including that might make me miss my connecting flight, all of which happened for me recently when I went to Switzerland and then to Austria to teach there uh, recently. Um, and OK, all that. But then the grumbling gets added the second darts, the third darts that we throw ourselves, right? Um, we 
get our own judgmentalness in the mix as fuel and as kind of bridges that move from the hedonic tone to craving, right? <clears throat> Along the heels or, uh, of a lot of selfing, me, myself, and I, how dare they do that to me? I paid full price for that ticket. United Airlines, bad. You know, and all my stories about executives and C-suites making million-dollar salaries. Whoa. You know, <laughs> whoa. You know, boom, boom, boom. Self-inflicted suffering. All that judgmentalness is just added to and isn't going to make my plane on time. Uh, it's not going to in any way, shape, or form change a single thing. Uh, and it's just only going to make me suffer more and other people suffer more if I dump that on them. So you might think about, you might think about, uh, you know, being judgmental in your daily life and what it's like for other people in your life to feel the weight of your judgments. It's a real thing. And again, I really encourage you to relate to this material simply and emotionally in clear terms, not abstractly or philosophically. Um, honestly, one of the most powerful ways I know for individuals, and we have 393 counting me here tonight, and I'm included, one of the most powerful ways for us to suffer less and cause less harm is to whew, be less identified with our judgments. They may arise, but can we step back from them and witness them? They're going by on the ticker tape, the chiron on the screen of awareness while we watch them and go, wow, that's really biased. Whoa, that's really scornful. Whoa, that's really judgmental. Whoa, that's really narrow-minded. Can we see that about ourselves, right? And, you know, disengagement at a minimum. I think PA made a comment seven minutes past the hour, just forms of suffering, you know, that, that come to us by being judgmental. Uh, you know, can we listen to people before passing judgment? Can we create more of a buffer between us and them? Can we allow more time, you know? to elapse before we come in with our judgments. This is a really big area, really big area, and a really big opportunity to practice. And I really encourage you, you know, to, to do what I've been doing a lot in, um, you know, uh, the last year and a half or so, which is kind of looking squarely at some of my own patterns and the ways in which even certain kinds of judgments about other people can lead us to make significant, even catastrophic mistakes. You know, we're so mad at them not pulling their weight that we don't slow down to, um, to make a call that would prevent a catastrophic event, All right? Okay. And also, and also, the other side of the truth, which is the ways in which it's entirely appropriate to be judgmental in certain ways. So let's consider that. So here we have discernment and we have valuing. And we have hedonic tones of liking this, not liking that. Okay. Um, think about the first noble truth, uh, pardon me, think about the first element listed in the Eightfold Path as typically wise view or right view. And the best translation for the Pali is probably right, with that sense of this is right, other things are wrong, this is right, it included, it's both accurate and true, as well as um, wholesome and beneficial. This is the right way to see things. Now, maybe the Buddha was wrong, but, but he described this as the right way to look at things. Okay, that's a view, and it's the right view, and so things that are not that view 
are are wrong or things that oppose it are wrong. And um, right there is a judgment. Right there is a valuing of a certain kind of view. It's right. Right directly there is a valuing of the Four Noble Truths, which are what um, the first element of the Eightfold Path consists of, right view. On the heels of that, number two, comes right intention. Intentions are about valuing. We intend to go left rather than right. We're valuing left pragmatically over right. In our case, now, right intention. The right intentions to renounce attachment to sense pleasures, we can still enjoy them without adding craving to them. That's one of the three elements of right intention. Consider that as an ongoing practice and appreciate the value of the renunciate uh, approach to life, including extreme forms that sometimes we undertake when we go on a retreat for the duration. Sometimes we undertake during formal meditation um, in which we focus on something and renounce all else, we disengage from all else. Sometimes people uh, uh, become monastics of various kinds or take certain oaths or vows in which they renounce certain things, uh, maybe for 40 days of Lent, but there's that quality of it. So there's that. Second element of right intention is um, the intention of non-harming, including ourselves. Think about the harms we do to ourselves by being judgmental in the problematic ways. Okay. We can be wisely judgmental about being unwisely judgmental. There's a place for that, not harming. And then third element of right intention is the intention to release ill will toward others, letting go of, you know, um, what a friend of mine calls TOCD, Trump Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, as an example of deep preoccupation and rumination in certain circles, uh, some of whom I know well as friends, uh, that just obsess about all that and are just so caught up in fantasies of vengeance and punishment and hatred, really. It's a poison in their heart. Uh, we can discern things accurately and we can have clear values and we can act on our values in various ways, including voting, without getting swept away with ill will. That's a practice. It's best to start where it's easy and build out from there and work all the way out to the ones that are hardest for you. And if you can't get there, uh, you know, then that's, that's where you're at. It's okay. This is all about where's your practice at, not you know, judging yourself for falling short of some ideal case way up here, down here. Can we release ill will? You know, I play a game in my mind. How rapidly can I get off it with my wife? Uh, right? Within, how quickly can I get off my position and my kind of eh about her? Within seconds? Yeah. Yeah. Or can I function in ways in which no ill will can even arise? Right? So there's a place. There's a place for those kinds of discernments and values, absolutely, marked clearly in the heart of the Buddha Dharma, right? Also, there's the focus on skillfulness and skillful means, upaya. Roshi Joan Halifax's center in New Mexico is called upaya, skillful means. Uh, there's um, another kind of close word is akusala, for unskillful, uh, not, not skillful. Um, a, uh, someone I've gained a good deal from is an, is an abbot of a Buddhist monastery, a Theravadan monastery in New Zealand, Ajahn Kusalo. Wonderful, wonderful being and teacher, Ajahn Kusalo, skillfulness. There's a place for valuing skillfulness, right? More or less skillful. And um, I think that it just seems incredibly obvious to me that it's skillful to become more skillful, <laughs> right? About anything that matters. Uh, you know, I'm probably going off coffee, darn, you know, kind of help my tummy. And so I'm exploring the wonderful world of matcha. 
that stuff's like a drug. <laughs> it's intense. So I'm trying to become more skillful in green tea matcha, you know? Wow. Or skillful as a driver, skillful interpersonally, skillful with our own mind. I find it very bizarre that routinely people in the Buddhist world who, you know, preach the myth of have no judgments, uh, they have tons of judgments about skillfulness applied to the outer world, right? Uh, you know, they, they cook skillfully. Uh, they, uh, you know, make diff many choices about more skillful ways to speak with other people. Uh, they do their work skillfully. Uh, they appreciate a, a meal that's prepared skillfully, and they'll come back to that restaurant, and they won't come back again if it wasn't a very skillfully made meal, all right? Uh, you know, and yet being skillful with their own mind exercising skillfulness with their own thoughts and feelings rea and reactions, whoa, that's anathema. It makes no sense to me at all. You know, if any domain <laughs> should be a field, field of skillful practice, it's our own minds to the extent that we can nudge it, you know, in skillful ways. So there's an enormous place here for skillfulness, right? Skillfulness. Skillfulness is judgmental. It's inherently judgmental, okay? Third kind of, I think, judgmentalness is really summarized, I believe, in the quotation, please correct me if I got it wrong, of Maya Angelou. Um, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time, uh, attributed to her, I, I believe. And um, there's a kind of clarity that can come in that sometimes is partakes of nibbida, disenchantment, in which we start to see people as they are. And we start to see amidst their fundamental good heart and, and amidst the ways in which life has landed on them and, and jerked them around and, and trained them to be certain kinds of ways, okay? In addition to that, we can start to discern kind of clearly what we can actually count on them for. And we start being able to form more skillful, which is to say more accurate predictions about their behavior in the future. We see them more clearly, and we start seeing people judgmentally, but in healthy ways that really are not committed to keeping their agreements with us. Or people whose friendship for us is about an inch deep and really cannot be counted on to come through if we really need some help. Or we can see certain people that can be really wonderful, but they just cannot repair any misunderstanding, broken agreement, problematic. They just, they can't do it, you know? And um, we recognize that more and more clearly with good judgment, you know? Good judgment. I see Ole here has brought in, you know, bad judgment, good judgment. Uh, you know, fine. You know, if the, the, the labeling might be really quite helpful here. Uh, you know, judgment that serves, judgment that helps versus judgment that harms, okay? Uh, and I think one of the meta skills uh, about skillful judgment is to be able to depersonalize it and um, not get so caught up in our judgments and identified with them and we get so, we take them so personally and we get righteous about them and we start you know, praising ourselves for having those judgments, that's problematic. Even if we start with, quote unquote, good judgments, but we get our egos in the mix, then that can <laughs> lead to bad judgment. Uh, fourth, <clears throat> uh, there's a place, I think, for realizing that we messed up. That's judgmental. That's discerning and valuing right there. You realize, wow, I did something at a minimum that uh, could be more skillful next time. There's a judgment right there. Beyond that, sometimes we look at what we did or are doing, and in our value system, ouch, that's worthy of genuine, healthy remorse. I need to change. I need to do better next time. 
And perhaps I need to apologize. Maybe I need to clean up a mess if I possibly can. Maybe I need to try to repair if I possibly can. Um, and, you know, set forth on a higher road. Or also, often, it's not even a matter that we made a mistake. It's not a matter of skillful correction or a matter of healthy remorse, which are two different forms of good judgment. It's more that here we are in this point in life and we realize, you know, you know, the, de the, the minutes, the breaths, the seconds, the hours, the days and the years are ticking away and I really ought to X. I really ought to explore drinking less coffee. Uh, I ought to meditate more, whatever that might be. Or maybe you realize, you know, it's really time finally to get serious about weight training. It's really time to get serious about paying attention to my blood sugar and fewer carbohydrates. You know, maybe it's really time to not let a kind of chilly silence, uh, you know, extend day after day with that friend I had that somehow we've drifted apart. And you, and you realize that it would be good for you. That's a judgment. It would be good for you to, to take some action, if only inside your own mind. And you, and you act upon that good judgment, that it would be good for you to take a certain path. What do you think would be good for you to do in thought, word, or deed that you're not doing yet? That's a confrontation with good judgment for yourself. So now I'm going to respond as best I can to some of the questions that have come in. This is a kind of summing up. Um, on the one hand, yes, there are problems with certain kinds of judgmentalism. Thus, the often common Buddhist belief of have no judgments, on the one hand. On the other hand, I think that sometimes we can not be judgmental enough. We can um, be overly enchanted, sometimes out of a kind of childlike innocence about who and what other people actually are. Uh, sometimes we can evade, we can get lazy about recognizing what's unskillful and what would instead be more skillful. And sometimes we can um, not even think about what might be good for us in the remaining days and years of our lives and, uh, and really open to the knowing of what would be good and act upon it. And you know, that's an opportunity for, for being you know, judgmental in good ways about your path going forward. Okay, it's a really big topic, isn't it? Uh, let me just take a look at the stuff that's come in. Um, again, I really urge you to get out of philosophizing, disengage, you know, from philosophizing or, you know, semantic hair splitting and come down into, wow, feeling in your body what it's like to be judgmental in problematic ways on the one hand and feeling in your body on the other hand, what is wholesome and healthy for you about being committed as a form of judgment to that which is good for you and others. Bring it down to earth for you. That's what will benefit you. More than conceptualizing and philosophizing here, that's what will benefit you. Disengaging from corrosive judgmentalism on the one hand uh, and engaging in, especially the implications of the actions that flow forth from being judgmental in good ways. Okay, so some, uh, I forget the name. I see you, Lynn. I also had someone else just before we started who put her hand up. Um, if you put your hand up, you can come back to the front. Uh, use that uh, reactions button at the bottom of your screen maybe while you're doing that. So Lynn, uh, as usual, and we've got about six minutes here, uh, 
question short to the point of general interest. Okay, asking you to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I guess this is a sharing, but also question two. Um, I'm a very judgmental person. I'm aware of it. I hear my mother echoing in my mind. I'm yeah. sitting in the McDonald's parking lot. Someone gets out of a car. I have judged how she looks, how she walks. And then it hits me that the, the pain of this world, I'm contributing to it. Yeah. By doing that. That's beautiful and so I guess to recognize. Yeah. It was just, it just shook me to the core. Beautiful. And then I want to slow you down and completely <laughs> tip my hat to you. As Thank you. that moment we can all appreciate, it's one of the hardest moments. It's like a reckoning with ourselves. It just, it's Beautiful. like it, it just shook me. And, and so one thing I do, which to try to slow it down, skillful means, is like there was a First Nations person that I saw and I know her history just because of the First Nations problems in this country. And it's so easy to go to, why don't they this? Why don't they that? And so the thing that I put in my mind is you have something to teach me. Ah. That's great. Well, Lynn, I'm going to keep going if that's okay. Just because there's, no, that's a beautiful share. Uh, I just, I, I want to respond to questions and I'm just attentive to the time. Um, but wow. I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to take that with me. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, thank you. I'm going to take your words with me too. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Great. Okay, great. Um, Lillian, and if you are who I think you are, I'm so glad. Where'd you go, Lillian? Um, why don't you put your hand back up so I can make sure you're unmuted? Lillian Lahiri? Where'd you go? I was so excited that you were there. Hmm. Okay. There you are. Great. I have to ask you to unmute. There we go. That's the button. So I, you unmute. Oh, I kept trying to unmute, but I can't until you ask me. Um, it's similar to Lynn's comment that I'll notice, I'm pretty good at noticing, oh my goodness, that was biased. And then I uh, repent, you know, it's like, yeah. but then almost synchronously with the repentance, there is the judgment and condemnation and shame, ah. having this uh, be a part of my life. And it seems to me there must be more skillful means for processing that feeling of shame for still, after all these years of practicing kindness, uh, you know, being judgmental. Just unbidden thoughts, you know. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up. And I'm, as you know, you're naming it. That's a kind of judgmentalism applied to ourselves. That's really toxic and not good. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I could offer a few things that I've found to be quite helpful about that, right? Um, one, paradoxically, is to allow a moment of remorse if that arises. And interestingly, if we actually just open to it, that moment of, ugh, of wincing internally, if we, if we in fact just open to it and kind of let it flow, then it tends to flow fairly rapidly. That's, that's something to pay attention to. Uh, like, just allowing that, okay, good. And um, actually, as a detail, I, I, I think that sometimes the function of a verbally saturated, righteous self-condemnation cascade serves the function of preventing the emotion of remorse. And yeah, because ah. it deflects us, it pulls us out of the feeling into this very verbal, cognitive, conceptual cascade. And um, yeah, yeah, bingo. So, okay. And uh, so I, I think that's something to pay attention to. And, and, so, and instead, you know, what helps us to kind of ground out the experience is to let the remorse actually flow. Okay. Then what I find helpful is, is a, a kind of, it's close to compassion for myself uh, that basically, uh, winces at the sludge that sometimes arises from the basement of my mind. But for me, that I don't, I remind myself that 
I'm not morally implicated in the sludge that arises unbidden from the basement of my mind. I'm morally implicated in what I do about it. And here too is something beautiful from the Buddha. He emphasized intentional action. What are our intentions? So when that sludge arises, then what happens? Do we hop on board it? Do we fuel it? Do we go, yeah, yeah, those people are really horrible, right? Or do we um, intentionally disengage from it? Disengage from it. That's where the, that's the moral uh, calculus. That's where that has to be. That's where the accounting occurs. And, um, right? And just knowing that, uh, that's helpful. And then to me, kind of appreciating what big monkeys we are, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, <"Bleh!" laughs> so, you know, it, it just comes up. Uh, yeah. Okay. So those, those things sound Common me. humanity. Yeah. That's right. Recognition. Yeah. Yeah. And then over time, more and more, you just start to notice that certain things happen and those old judgments get softer and softer and less compelling. And then you can appreciate the practice and the progress you're making. Thank you. That was revelatory. Well, thank you. And I'm so glad you're here, actually. I'm uh, delighted to be here. That's great. Well, I'm going to try, and people can leave if they want to, I'm going to try to move fairly rapidly through Jovian and Meredith, and then we'll finish for everybody, okay? So it's a really interesting, compelling topic, isn't it? This judgmental thing. All right, good. Jovian. Uh, hi there, Rick. Uh, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, yeah. So I noticed when I'm out in the world, um, you know, I do a lot of meditating and practicing and so forth. Um, I find it really easy to be non-judgmental. I, I just, you know, I, I feel deep compassion and devotion. I see through the eyes of compassion and devotion with you know, pretty much everyone I meet. As soon as I get behind the screen, I notice that that starts to dissipate and I get shrunk into my kind of closed off siloed individuality. And I was on, I was uh, on with a customer service agent yesterday and uh, I, I felt she was being very obstinate and I was not as kind as I would be if I was yeah. dealing with someone in person because it was all text on a screen. It was just yeah. no pixels on the screen. And I forgot that the heart, the tender yes. heart, and the person is behind it. And so much more of our lives is behind these screens now. Yep. So how do you keep that? Oh, that's, a, that's great, Jovian. Yeah. Um, what it makes me think about immediately is the ways in which certain physical activity, certain, you know, we're using our bodies, notably our eyes, when we're, you know, looking at a screen. And certain kinds of physical activities or certain kinds of situations tend to be contracting, self-referential, and they tend to feed judgmentalness. So the, the actual physical neurological processes of engaging the eyes in very um, specific visual detail while using language at the time really tends to load pretty heavily on frontal midline executive regions that are da, 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 the seat of judgment. So just doing that activity of staring intently at a screen, really focusing, thinking hard and using language starts to warm up the circuitry inherently that, that is also used to be judgmental. It doesn't mean we have to be judgmental, but we've been warming up the circuitry. Other things that are more uh, ancient and primordial in us, getting competitive. If we're in competitive environments, you know, uh, with intensity and we're competing with other people, that can tend to foster a certain judgmentalness. I think about situations I've been in in which I'm, you know, normally a mellow guy, I'm having fun, I'm playing, doing a sports thing. And uh, there's um, something that happens, like there's a referee who makes a bad call. Whoa, how quickly, right? Can we get angry at the umpire? Uh, like, what? Where'd that come from? It's like this head of steam was already built up in us. So for me, there's a kind of humility 
and uh, modesty and just recognizing uh, inter, you know, interdependent origination that just, like I said, the chain of dependent or interdependent origination, we are dependent. And so if we are doing those things that modern work calls us to, like working long hours a day, you know, concentrated on visual detail on a small screen, engaging language, um, I think it's really particularly helpful to uh, uh, warn ourselves that we're kind of getting primed for trouble. And one thing I do that I find just really useful, drawing on some brain science that I talk about in the book Neurodharma, is to go wide. You know, people also visually, you know, optometrists will give you the advice, look away from the screen, look out a window, raise your gaze, look up at the corners of the room that you're in. I'll do that, peri you know, periodically. Stretch your back, close your eyes, you know, go wide. And then in your imagination, imagine the big picture, the bird's eye view. Go big, go wide. Um, that is a great way to defeat the kind of contraction that occurs when we're doing all this intense visual processing saturated with language. Yeah. And then I try to keep in mind that there's a being on the other end of the phone. And I also, you know, I, I, can, I admit it, I congratulate myself for not being a wanker. <laughs> You know, on this customer service call, I try to not be that guy, that person who just goes ballistic over the fact that my stuff's going to get here a day later, you know, whatever. Um, you know, and, you know, there you could play a game in which without being obsequious, you could still be clear, you could still pursue your aims, uh, in which you just, you sit in a kind of blessing disposition and you really enjoy it. You, you value it in its own right. You're kind of radiating bodhicitta, radiating goodwill, you know. Uh, that other person is moving through that field. Uh, and you do that for your own sake and also for theirs. Okay. Uh, you've disappeared from my Zoom screen, but that's okay. Hopefully that was helpful. Yes, Jovian? Maybe you muted yourself. Anyway, hopefully that was useful. All right. I'm on the home stretch here for Meredith, asking you to unmute. You got to unmute yourself there. Question that's focused and of general interest. Can you unmute yourself, Meredith? I thought Great. I had. Or, yeah. Yeah, no worries. Great. I had um thank you for this evening. Um had a very unexpected interesting to me uh, experience around judgment. For whatever reason I don't remember. I was reading something and an article about the pope and where he had been and where he, what he had said and just you know one of the articles in some paper. And um they, the article quoted what he said about um, um, LGBTQ people, yeah. um, noting that he had said, um, who am I to be judgmental? And, which I think is wonderful, and also my surprise response in me was oh this is a little embarrassing but oh it's okay to not be judgmental and when i thought about that um or um it sounds to me like very old um or very young <laughs> attachment to either of my parents but right these days it's my mother um and her view um, and that as a little girl, I wouldn't have questioned it. Yeah. I would have believed, felt, well, this is how we live. Yeah. You know? And so, and this, and then you just mentioned, uh, competitiveness and, um, uh, very tragically, my mother, my sister and I, none, none of us were mothered, um, mm. for various reasons. Um, nobody's fault. And the competitiveness among my sister, my mother, and myself was just fierce. Yeah. Um, and, and you can see the judgmentalness in it. Yeah. Yeah. And the innocence. When you oh. say, you know, it's like, um, meaning when it's not. I mean, when it's okay not to judge what's really happening, you know, there's just this 
triangulation of grief and despair and loneliness and all kinds of things, you know, all kinds of yeah. experiences other than who's going to get it or who's the it girl or who matters or, you know, yeah. it's just very well, interesting. Well, thank you, Meredith. And um, I mean, what I'm hearing in part is a kind of, like you said at the very beginning, the freedom not to judge, not to pick good or bad, up or down, winners, losers, right? Right or wrong. Um, and we can all probably feel the easing in our minds as we open into that sense of that more. And with its qualities, like you said, of innocence, and, and I would add some curiosity and um, patience. Patience, by the way, is a great antidote to uh, negative judgmentalism, patience. Uh, I remember seeing a, um, I'll finish here, a monk in an airport where there was a flight delay, just kind of calmly walking in, sitting down, you know, adjusting his robe, closing his eyes. You know, he was fine. You know, he was fine. The, the present moment was just fine for him. Uh, anyway, well, thank you. I'll, yeah. well, Okay, let me say also, Lynn, Lynn from Calgary, I, Lynn from Calgary, I cut you off a little short and here I am going long. So next time, Lynn, ask a question that I'm definitely gonna take more time. Okay, Meredith, just a couple more minutes, okay? Yeah. I'm so sorry, Lynn. Oh, oh no, you didn't do anything to her. I made a call. I'm just, I'm just uh, correcting something that I'm gonna oh, fix for the next time. But you're good. Okay, a couple more minutes, Meredith, and then we'll wrap up. Oh, talk to her. What I meant? In my mind, uh, when I said innocence, yeah, and the innocence of any young child it happened to be me, you know, in my experience, um, attaching to what seemed to be or, um, the quote rightness of being judgmental. Yes. Wow, you no, know, yeah. this is how the world is, this is what's supposedly good. This is my mother yeah. who I adore, and so. This is a profoundly confused sense of good. I think that's so beautifully insightful, Meredith. You know, the innocence of that girl identifying with that judgment of your mother's, internalizing it, and then gradually realizing, you know, years later, uh, courtesy of the Pope in part, uh, that you could, you don't have to, you don't have to hold that judgment, while also you don't have to judge yourself for having had that judgment. That's true. Which you internalized, which you internalized so innocently. Yes. Like you're saying, exactly like you are saying. Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, the big hugs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if people hug the Pope, but anyway. Oh, not well. I think I hugging that. you would be really good. I think there's a I good collective. Me, but hug. I wouldn't mind hugging the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> this Pope, especially. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for well, the time. Oh, thank you, Meredith. Really touching the hearts here. 